Welcome back to Good Morning Law Land. We are live in Los Angeles and drinking wine for breakfast. Why not? <laughs> We're breaking all the rules on Transformation Tuesday. We have got the founders and creators of the Winemaker Series podcast in the house, Lauren and Louise. Thank you so much for being with us today. You guys have like the dream job for a lot of people. I mean, for jazz, jazz. for yeah. sure. Yeah. I, when I first saw the trailer for your podcast, I was like, oh, how did I miss out on this? <laughs> what is it like? to be able to go to all of these cool cult wineries and be able to experience what most people could only dream of. Well, it's a fantastic experience. We just did this first series in Paso Robles, so we, we haven't yet managed to venture to all of the other different areas, but I'm sure Sala Media will be working on that in, in the future. Oh, it's coming. But yeah. Tell us about your experience in Paso Robles. Well, I'll let Louise, Louise answer this one because she was, she was on the ground for several days Drinking. <laughs> and look how beautiful that ground is. Oh, yeah. It was wow, so, so pretty. Beautiful. This was actually in oh, um, April, May of last year that we first went up and shot some of the initial episodes. And it's a really different experience that you get there from some of the other different wine tasting regions in California. You get a really kind of rustic, authentic experience of what the winemaking process is all about. Meeting those winemakers as well gives you a real in-depth insight into the process that you go through from nurturing the vines to the fermentation process, the barrel rooms, and then doing all of the tastings in the cellar afterwards. Was there anything that surprised you when you're going through these vineyards that you didn't know? I think just how much farming there really is involved with the whole process. Because I think when you go to some of the more glamorous places to do wine tasting, you're just sitting in a nice place, mm -hmm. sipping away at the wine, and you don't really realize what goes into it. Yeah, in my head, I think it'd be brilliant to retire and own a vineyard, but farming, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> so, your podcast, you. so your podcast is not a traditional podcast. It's a video podcast, which is really fascinating, right? It's not a video podcast as such. We've just shot a lot for some of the teasers and the trailers. Oh, you do know that you can do that, that now podcasts are video as well on iTunes. It'd be really fascinating because you have such great and beautiful footage there. Yes, we have. And that footage will be being used with Seller, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we come the background is there's a lot of TV. It's a you know, TV people making a podcast. Yeah. Which is, it's funny. Some of the feedback has been, you know, when you hear the podcast, you want to see a lot, a lot right. of the feedback has been mm -hmm. that like, I, I feel like I want to see the images that go along with mm -hmm. it. So I guess that's There you go. The, uni the universe is talking people to you right yes. now. Yeah. I, see, I see the podcast. I hear the podcast. I just want to drink the wine. Exactly. <laughs> we want to bring you the Paso with a little sip of Velia's wine. So yeah. tell us a little bit about what we're tasting this morning. Well, this is Velia's wine, Velia from Desperada Wines. She is a, a fantastic um, female winemaker that really embraces mm that experience um, and make sure that a lot of the people within her winery wow. are all female as well. This is a Sauvignon Blanc that we're drinking now and this is the wine that we're featuring on the second episode of our podcast because every episode corresponds to a bottle of wine and the concept of our podcast is that you can purchase a companion case and you'll have a bottle for every episode that you can sit and enjoy and listen to the stories of the winemakers behind them. <laughs> Please don't tell Jeslyn anymore. Please don't. We need her. We're going to leave her. We're kind of like, like having her here. Yeah, she's <laughs> like, so much good morning, La La. We've got things to do. We're bringing to your set today. That's right. I love that. So tell us about the proper way to actually taste this wine. Put oh. it in your mouth. <laughs> oh, I love you. About That's this. my kind of winemaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but you're not. <laughs> Louise or Amelia, one of our other people would say, no. But I mean, I think what actually one of the goals of this is to, I mean, there is this kind of barrier to enter with wine and people think it's this fancy thing. You have to have a certain skill set or a certain, je ne sais quoi, to be able to go into a wine and uh, to, to a restaurant and order a wine off a menu. And it, it, they, everyone says wine should be fun. Mm -hmm. Like every one of these winemakers, like, wine should be fun. You should have fun drinking it. There shouldn't be these rules. Like I think there's been a stiffness and a sort of, and we're trying to break that down with storytelling and, and mm -hmm. the human and, and just mm -hmm. have fun, drink wine. And, and it's the stories that then you create with your friends drinking that wine. I love that. When did your passion for wine and winemaking start? I've always had a passion for wine. Um, I think I grew up with two parents who love wine as well. We would do wine tastings in the house. We'd have people come and do wine tastings. And, you know, in England, you only have to be 18 to drink. So... <laughs> in France, you have to be even younger. <laughs> you know, we're very close to France. So, you know, we, we drunk from a young age, or at least tried things from a young age. And 
then when I traveled around the world, I would go to different vineyards and just get that experience. So I've always been very interested in it. And mm. when this opportunity came, it just sort of really merged all my passions of wine and hosting mm. together. And it's, it was yeah. such a great experience. Yeah. Mm. What, what surprised you most about winemaking and wine? Something that you didn't know going in? You go, Lauren. <laughs> I mean, the, I always said I've always been wine curious, but this has definitely like opened up my wine world and, and meeting these people. And there's, I mean, I guess all, what, maybe what surprised me there's there's so many ways you can actually make a bottle of wine, which you don't. I mean, in the end, it always it all sort of looks similar. It's in a bottle and different labels, but like the amount of the number of decisions, and I think what also kind of started to dawn on me that like the stakes, you know, that are involved. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a chef makes a bad meal, you throw it away. A winemaker makes a bad bottle of wine. It's a whole vintage. It's a year of their life. So I think just like the, the amount of just heart, soul, blood, sweat, and tears that these winemakers actually put into that bottle, that I think was like, maybe I knew it, but I didn't really know it until I went and like met mm. these people and started hearing their stories. And especially Actually. when it comes to blends, because Paso is an area that they do a lot of blends. And that whole process is very different dependent on the winemaker. Some might decide to blend in the barrel. Some might decide to blend before putting it in the bottle. So there's, there's all these different areas and it's, you know, each year it's going to be slightly different because the grapes are grown differently, and so it's the sheer number different. of decisions. Yeah, it's like yeah. what do you blend them out? When do you pick them? When do you mix? Them? How? I mean, then there's people that are super scientific. There's people that are like back to you know back to the roots. It's like you know people have been drinking wine for you know thousands mm -hmm. of years. It's, yeah, and it's a big status thing. I would imagine that there's there's vineyards that probably don't even make much money because it's their passion and they it's a yeah. status thing, right? I mean, are there some that I make a lot of money? Do you know that side of it? There's, I don't think anybody, these winemakers, really do it for status. Like, you have to have, like, the amount of sacrifices you make, mm. it's not like, I'm not doing this for a status thing. It's not like a series of decisions you make for a status. I mean, I, you know, there, there's owners or maybe somebody that's made a lot of money in another field. Like, there are those wineries mm -hmm. where somebody's made yeah. a lot of money, and then, and it's it's kind of like they've worked really hard their whole life, and now yeah. we want to mm -hmm. invest that in a winery. It's like something I'm passionate about. But then there are those other ones, which a lot of the smaller producers were discovering that, like, they made that decision early on. They gave up, you know, and so they're working mm. and making sacrifices mm -hmm. and, and building these small things. And it's not, I mean, it's more about the perfect, maybe it's the status of the perfect bottle of wine, not like financial or... And, and, but they're producing mm. amazing wine because of it. Yeah. They're, they're putting their heart and soul into these bottles of wine. What do you think of it? Whoever put their heart and soul into this bottle of My deepest gratitude to you. I'll put this in my gratitude journal this morning. Desperado. Thank you. I love it. It's very smooth. It's very bright. I'm a huge fan of Sauvignon Blanc, especially in the summertime. But even on this cold, rainy day in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. it is a nice treat in the morning. It really is. Yeah. When we when we did this with the podcast, we we had some fish and some um, a little pea salad that went with it, so it was, a, it was perfect to go with this. Mm -hmm. But that was when it came up in conversation that this was a perfect breakfast wine. Right. And mm -hmm. I think so the line we have to ask the yeah. question, and I know that you may not be able to answer, but do you have a favorite wine hmm. up there? I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say it. Jeez, don't put her on the spot like that. <laughs> tonight because so, we have to face all the winemakers. So what, <laughs> what would you behind the scenes, would you say that you had one or a few or how many, like if, if the camera, if the microphone wasn't on? Because I know you can't really totally do that. I think the wines that we're featuring are all quite different, actually. We've got, this is the only white that we're featuring within our companion case. Um, but we tasted a lot of the other wines when mm -hmm. we were up there. So... Maybe, for example, one of the reds that we're featuring in our companion cases is, is done because it's so different to the other wines that we're featuring, mm -hmm. and that's why we've yeah. chosen yeah, that particular yeah. one. Yeah, they made a balance of wines. But yeah. <laughs> do you guys, do you, the more that you know and learn about wine, does it make it more and more difficult to make decisions when you're at dinner in your personal time to like make, you know, like how do you decide? Is it all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, I now realize that instead of just one simple decision, there are thousands that have went into this single Are you glass. wine snobs is basically what he's asking. <laughs> I just feel like it'd be difficult. It's it would be hard, right? It's a paradox, a choice yeah. challenge. I, yeah, and I'm not even an expert in wine, but I do notice the difference now. I've tasted some really good wine going and, and drinking a cheap yeah. bottle of wine that maybe someone else has ordered. <laughs> I think for me, it's actually the opposite. I think it's sort of in, in, Powered, or like at least when I approach a wine menu, I have some sort of, you know, 
something to go for. At least I'm like learning. Okay, like I, I've tried this scrape from there. Let me try it again. I mean, I think it, it, wine menus can be so overwhelming. Yeah. So I think it's at least given me a tiny bit of like insight into it. Oh, and it made it more. It's made it more accessible. Um, and every time I'm tasting now a new wine, I try to get an understanding of the flavors that are on my palate and see if I can mm. sense that before maybe looking at the bottle and mm. seeing what that has to say. I will say this pairs very nicely with my coffee really? this morning. I can double fist this, no problem. <laughs> Tell everyone where they can listen to your podcast and get the companion box. You, you can listen to the podcast if you go to um, any of the platforms so, yeah. that do podcasts. And you can also go to the website, which is winemakerseries.com abbreviated to WMNKRS.com forward slash podcast. And there's a link there where you can click on to get the companion case to drink alone. Wherever you subscribe to podcasts, the winemaker series. Brilliant idea. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. And I love the wine. The wine. <laughs> I know, right? right? Yeah. 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 We'll be back with more on Good Morning Lala Land. <laughs>